Hey everybody, it's Zach from TennisProDoc.com and today we're going to be exploring what makes a tennis shoe unique for tennis. But first, we got to cut it open to find out, so let's do it. So let's talk about what makes a tennis shoe unique for tennis. The first thing you'll notice is this is a right shoe. This is the outside or lateral side of the shoe, and this is the inside or the medial side of the shoe. The first thing you'll notice is this lateral flange. This is called the lateral flange. It's an outcropping of the outside of the shoe, and this gives you side-to-side -side stability or what we call lateral stability in tennis. If the shoe didn't have this lateral flange, if it just kind of came in like this, like most training or running shoes, the shoe would be too narrow. And as soon as you went to cut side to side, you would roll. So with this lateral flange that's unique to tennis shoes, this prevents you from rolling by giving you just that little bit of moment of stability when you're going back and forth. So if you don't have a lateral flange, you don't have a tennis shoe. So let's open up. This shoe here, I'm actually going to put the lateral side over here for now. We're going to focus on the inside of the shoe. This is the insole of the shoe. These are removable. Typically, people will replace this with a custom orthotic or an over-the-counter orthotic. You'll notice, though, on a tennis shoe, these are a little more dense than it would be with a training shoe or a cross trainer or a running shoe, just because of the bouncing involved in tennis any tennis shoe worth its salt will give you a little more of a dense insole. Um, let's put that over there. So next, let's go from bottom to top talking about the shoe. You got the rear foot, the midfoot, and the forefoot, breaking down into three sections. The outsole of the shoe needs to do a few things, the tread. Number one, it needs to grip. Number two, it needs to be able to slide. Three, it needs to last. And four, it needs to not mark the court. It needs to be non-marking. So most companies have their own proprietary blend of rubbers and polys that they use in the outsole uh, to grip. So uh, you'll see different names, different proprietary names on these uh, outsoles. Uh, just that's their different rubber blends. Now, the most important thing about the outsole of a tennis shoe is the tread itself. I like a dense herringbone like this is because you can use it on clay because the herringbone will grip the clay and as you can see it gets more narrow and then it gets uh, wider. This is good because up here this will grip the hard court whereas down here you'll see where these herringbone patterns get more dense they'll grip the clay a little better. Now if you move the shoe out here you will notice that the outsole of the shoe, the, out, the, um, the tread outsole of the shoe, envelops the upper of the shoe. Okay, this is called the upper of the shoe. This is all the outer of the shoe, but this is the upper of the shoe. The outsole here envelops the upper, and what this is good for is number one, toe dragging. If you walk into your serve, that's another reason, uh, or just sliding in, in general. What this will do is this will prevent the upper of the shoe from wearing down too thin after just a few slides on a hard court. You'll notice this is also reinforced with one more layer of stitching. This stitching also just gives a little more durability to the outer of the shoe, or the upper of the shoe, I'm sorry. Also the outsole blends with the midsole. This is what we're going to talk about next. The outsole blends with the insole, giving the shoe more stability side to side. So let's look at the midsole. Most people, when they look at a tennis shoe online, when they're going to buy one, they look and they see the midsole has a cushioned midsole. That's a little bit of a misnomer. The best types of midsole for a tennis shoe are ones that are very dense. You still want some spring, you still want some feedback, right? You want it to conform to your foot over time, but you do want it to have some memory. What memory is, is that material bouncing back at you. That is gonna give you the most shock absorption. It's gonna help prevent ankle arthritis, knee arthritis, hip arthritis, and lower back pain. 
because this is taking the shock. If it's too cushioned, too like a, a down pillow, you're going to get more shock into your joints. It might feel better at first, but in the long run, it's going to harm you. Now, the next thing you'll notice about the midsole is this piece right here. This is the shank. This is a key important part of a tennis shoe. And usually a tennis shoe will have one that's a little longer in the shoe. Now here I'll show you what this sounds like. This is a much more dense material. Usually they're carbon fiber. So let me show you. So you can hear the difference in sound. This looks more like a polypropylene midsole, just the way it cuts and the way it sounds and just the way it looks. I've seen a lot of these made with orthotics. So this looks more like polypropylene um, shank. What this does is this stabilizes the shoe when you're bouncing or when you're split stepping or when you're ready to return serve or when you're serving. Okay? This stabilizes the shoe and it also stops See how it has the arch of the shoe? It stops the arch of the shoe from collapsing. So if you have a flat foot, it'll stop the shoe from collapsing. Or if you have a tired arch, this is what stops the shoe from collapsing. The next thing about the midsole as we move into the forefoot of the shoe, do you see these three gaps? What that does is that allows the shoe to bend at the big toe joint. This is why it's so important to buy shoes that are the correct size for you. So make sure that when you size your foot, the person that is sizing it, or if you are sizing yourself, you use what's called a Brannock device, and that will accurately measure your foot. So as you can see, this is going to bend right at the big toe joint, and that's exactly where you want a tennis shoe to break. So now we're gonna look at the other part of the insole, the non-removable part of the insole. We already took out the removable part. Now let's take a look at the fixed part. What you'll notice is stitching, right? And this also continues along the lateral side as well. It's easier to see the contrast back here. Now what this does is, is this binds the midsole and the outsole of the shoe to the upper of the shoe. This is not unique for a tennis shoe, but it is important for any athletic shoe that this insole be very strong material to hold the upper of the shoe and the outsole and uh, the outsole and the midsole of the shoe. So that is very important. Now, what you'll notice is this material, you would think, why would we even need it? Why don't you just stitch directly to it? Well, when the shoe is put together, right, and now you have one big piece spanning the whole shoe, that's when you kind of notice it does give it a lot more stability and strength of the shoe. Now, also, you don't want your foot contacting the midsole directly or you'll start to erode it more. This thick piece of woven material here also acts as more of a durability uh, portion of the shoe. So let's move up the shoe. The most important part that I'm gonna show you in this segment is right here, this little piece right here. Now it doesn't look like much because it's all the same color, but we'll take the Dremel out again and I'll show you. So you notice we have different sounds. We have some cushioning, very small amount of cushioning right here. And then we have this very dense poly piece. That's the heel counter. And then aside from that, you actually have more padding on the outside of the heel. What this piece here, this heel, uh, the heel counter does, is this stabilizes your heel while playing tennis. You don't want the shoe to be bending like this. Obviously it's gonna bend here now because it's cut in half, but you want a very, very, very stiff heel counter. You also want one that goes up rather high. On this one, just to feel it, it goes up to here. Now, what you also wanna make sure of is that the heel counter goes forward in the shoe enough to meet the front part of your ankle, all right? because that's also what's gonna give you a lot of lateral stability. 
also what's going to prevent things like plantar fasciitis uh, and arch pain because the more your heel rocks back and forth in here when you have a heel counter that isn't very stiff the more strain you're going to put on the muscles trying to hold those joints together so in this shoe the heel counter comes to right here and it slopes down and it meets the midfoot portion of the shoe. So this is a very generous heel counter. It comes all the way down and you can see it while I bend the shoe. Now the next thing coming up the shoe, we'll start in the rear foot of the shoe, okay, is you'll notice there's really not a lot of padding under the heel. All the padding is on top. It's around the ankle and this is deliberate. This deliberately is pretty padded around the top part of your ankle and that's to lock your ankle into the shoe. You want the ankle locked in the shoe. So this is very generously padded up here, but not too much here. Honestly, for this particular shoe, I kind of would have liked it a little more if they would have put something back here, just something to prevent uh, increase in friction. But you'll notice here, pretty generous up here to lock your heel, lock your uh, foot into the rear foot of the shoe. As we move here into the midfoot of the shoe, you'll notice all this stitching. And what does that correlate to? So let's flip the shoe over. What that correlates to is this big end for New Balance, and then the part of here where the eyelets of the laces are, this is all the upper of the shoe. With this here, the end here is the eyelets of the shoe, this leather piece right here, this is all called foxing. And foxing are elements of the outer of the shoe that give it stability. Without any of these things, the shoe would just be able to twist. Now, like I said, I'm twisting it now because it's cut in half, but a full shoe would not twist as much and uh, it wouldn't break as much uh, when you're moving back and forth with all this foxing. If you'll notice, most tennis shoes do have quite a bit of foxing on them and there's some brands of shoes where they make the entire upper of the shoe have plastic and rubber components just to give it more stability so you have a, a more a, a more glove-like feeling on the top of the shoe. So that's the foxing. And this is very unique to tennis shoes. Running shoes and every other shoe also have foxing, but the amount of foxing usually on a tennis shoe is more than what you'll get on a cross trainer. Up here you got vents to try to uh, ventilate the shoe and we talked about this upper stitching prior when we talked about the outsole. So let's look at the tongue. Typically the tongue of a tennis shoe will have very thick padding and as you can tell this padding is pretty thick. You want this because playing tennis you're usually making quick movements and over time if this isn't padded very well you'll get some pinching, maybe some numbness up on the top of your foot or tingling into the toes. So typically these will, uh, these will be padded uh, pretty generously on any tennis shoe that's uh, worth anything. So just showing you, moving to the lateral side of the shoe, you have even more stability. As you see the lateral flange here, this shoe, actually the lateral flange comes all the way up here onto the outer of the shoe. And this acts as another element of foxing on the shoe. And this lateral flange is made of the midsole and the outsole. So on this shoe, you don't have as many elements of foxing on it, but you do have a much higher midsole that acts as an element of foxing and it accomplishes the exact same goal. Now most tennis shoes are gonna weigh somewhere between 10 and 16 ounces, give or take. On the lower end of that, on the lighter end, are going to be your speedier shoes. On the higher end, you're going to have your more durable, more comfort-focused shoes. That does not mean a lighter shoe can't be durable, and that does not mean a heavier shoe cannot break down after maybe a few weeks. You just kind of have to find out what you like best. Remember, at the beginning of a match, a heavy shoe isn't going to feel all that heavy, and at the end of the match, your legs might get tired. And at the beginning of a match, a lighter shoe might feel pretty stable and comfortable, but toward the end of a match, you might start getting some ankle, knee, hip, lower back pain. So that's why I say you wanna find a shoe in the middle of the road, and then if you're having any of those problems, usually find someone that makes a decent custom orthotic and throw them in, that's the best of both worlds. Now there are some differences between tennis shoes themselves and one other big area, and that is the tongue of the shoe. 
This is a traditional three-piece tongue. One, two, three. Even though this is cut down the middle, this is one, two, three. Some shoes will have what's called a slipper tongue, which means the heel of the shoe comes all the way around and envelops the tongue, so it's all one piece. This is a little more comfortable. It feels more like a sock. It kind of um, almost feels like a vacuum seal around your foot. Only bad part about that is, is that's only one piece of material, so you're more likely to roll for an ankle sprain. So if you want more stability, go with a three-piece tongue. So if you haven't been able to tell by now, I am a foot doctor by trade. That's my day job. So what we're going to be doing is performance reviews, durability tests, and teardowns of all the latest tennis shoes that come to market. So if you want to be the first to see your favorite new shoe, get the teardown treatment under my knife, click the subscribe button and the notification bell. That way you're the first to be notified when your favorite shoe gets the Tennis Pro Doc treatment. So thanks for hanging out with me, and thanks for coming in and leveling up your game with science.